Megan Campbell joining us today for, from uh, Birmingham Law School. And Megan is gonna be presenting a very interesting paper. And before we, we, we go into the paper, I wanted to let you know that Megan is gonna present for about 30 or 25, 30 minutes. And then we will open up the floor for Q&A. And the session is being recorded, so we will upload it later on in our YouTube channel. So you can see Megan's presentation there. Uh, it will be available, uh, hopefully, right after the meeting. So without further ado, Megan, all the, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to join you uh, but in what is this evening in the UK. And thank you for those of you participating uh, live for joining wherever you are in the world. So today I'm going to be talking about what I've entitled the austerity of single motherhood and looking at a series of cases in the UK at how the courts have adjudicated on social benefits claims raised by mothers. And the way the courts decided these claims speaks to these larger debates about what does it mean to be equal and what is the role of the court in accountability in social benefits largely the role of court and economic reform, these, these long-standing larger debates. So since about 2008, after the economic crisis, the UK, along with lots of other governments around the world, has you know, aggressively reformed the social benefit system. And under the umbrella of austerity, the UK has capped the amount of benefits any individual can claim to escape the income poverty imposed by the cap you have to work a certain number of hours in the paid market, kind of work conditionalities. And they've also limited the child subsistence benefit to two children. So if you have a third child, you don't get any uh, benefits or any sort of state support for that third child. And in a series of cases, these single mothers have argued that these benefit reforms are discriminatory. And as I said, the cases bring to the fore this, these questions about what does it mean to be equal and what's the role of the court in reviewing economic and social policy? And in this uh, discussion today, I'm going to develop two arguments. One is that the courts are applying this really thin model of equality that focuses only on income poverty and really glosses over the gendered harms sort of baked into these benefit reforms. And as a result of this thin model of equality, the courts mistakenly apply a very over, overly deferential standard of review in the justification analysis. So my main thesis is that attention to substantive equality is really the key to adjudicating these discrimination-based claims in social benefits. So turning to my, the first sort of strand of my argument about the, the thin model of equality. So there's a big question, like what does it mean to be equal? This is a question that many people have discussed and spent their whole life researching and thinking about. And there's so many conflicting answers to this question. And, and, and likelihood this question will never be definitively answered is what it means to be equal is probably always going to be evolving. But some of the answers that are given have been like, well, equality is about consistent treatment. And then the next question arises, well, consistent treatment of what? And are we supposed to be consistent in how much income we have? Are we supposed to be consistent in how much dignity we all are, have or treated with? And this is, again, this is big question about what does it mean to be equal? And then there's a related question about which institutions are supposed to address or redress inequalities. And the two that we'll be looking, I'll be talking about today are courts or legislative bodies. Which of these places are we supposed to get accountability for inequalities? And historically, there's been this divide in the mean of equality and where accountability lies. And they've kind of been grouped together in this, as I will argue, this artificial way. So inequalities that are based on stereotypes, prejudices, stigmas, these have been thought to address through the route of anti-discrimination law and through courts. So, you know, policies that are based on the idea that women can't be strong firefighters, this is something that anti-discrimination law is really well um, placed to redress. Economic inequalities, you know, the fact that poverty exists, this has not been seen as law. This is addressed through charity, moral or jest, or social policies, and any accountability is through the political institutions or the political process and not, not really appropriate for courts. And the legal claims of these single mothers essentially pushes against this divide in how we've seen a, defined equality or fractured equality between income inequality and status inequality, and pushed against this divide about where 
accountability for equality lies. Because the single mother's claims are saying that the regulations that are targeting are meant to kind of redress, I guess, economic inequalities are actually perpetuating gender-based stereotypes. So it's, it's saying the, the relationship between income inequality and status inequality are intermeshed, which at some gut level kind of makes sense. We can see through lots of the empirical evidence that groups that are historically outgroups, racial minorities, women, disabled people tend to cluster in economic poverty. So there seems to be something that's going on between status-based harms and economic inequalities. And essentially that's what the single mother's claims are raising. And they're specifically arguing um, in the context of the UK that there's been a violation of Article 1 of Protocol 1 of the European Convention on Human Rights on the right to peaceful enjoyment of possessions read in conjunction with the right to non-discrimination under Article 14 of the European Convention. And their claims have always been unsuccessful. There are these very long judgments, you know, 90 pages, lots of, you know, each judge writing their own, own judgment, and they're not succeeding. They're, they're constantly failing. So I came to this question, well, why are these claims failing? What's, what's going on with these cases? And my answer is a thin model of equality, because a careful assessment of what the single mother's claims are raising reveals that there are these status-based inequalities that are seeping in to economic and fiscal social policy and, and social regulation. That stereotypes on women, stereotypes on poverty are infiltrating the design of the benefit system. And that the benefit system is blind to these antecedent gendered disadvantages and structures. And when we look at their claims, we can just really see it's artificial to say the meaning of equality can be neatly segmented between status and income, and that accountability for equality can be neatly seg segmented between courts and legislative bodies. And in all due respect to the UK Supreme Court, this careful assessment about what is actually happening with these single mother's claims is, is so blatantly missing from these cases. On one hand, though, it, on a first reading of this case, is you'll think, you might think, oh, it's it's not. I'm I'm being a bit pessimistic. There's actually some things to be quite optimistic about because in all three cases, the court, um, the three cases were about the benefit cap, the work conditionalities, and the two child limit, which is what the press has kind of um, dubbed the uh, limit on the child tax credit. The courts all find that there has been prima facie this indirect discrimination. So on the discrimination analysis, the first stage of the case, the court says, yes, we accept that there's been indirect discrimination. Oftentimes the government will concede this as well. And that's because single mothers are disproportionately negatively impacted by the benefit cap, the work conditionality, and the two-child limit. The court identifies the negative discriminatory impact exclusively as income inequality. Single mothers will have less economic resources to meet their basic needs of food, housing, shelter, clothing, et cetera. And at first, this might, we can see this could be a step forward. We, are, we can see, okay, there is, the court is talking about a legal right to equality in terms of income. So it seems to be blending or, or these two different types of equality and blending the type of institution that we can get accountability for inequality. But Again, with all due respect to the Supreme, UK Supreme Court, there's a problem with this analysis for two reasons. In just saying that the impact of the claim is income and poverty, it's ignoring the gendered aspects of the claim, and it has a negative knock-on effect of creating confusion at the justification stage. So turning to looking at how, what is actually going on with these cases? How can we understand what's actually happening? And I argue that a richer concept of equality can give us tools to unravel the different types of equalities and really get a handle on what's happening. The four-dimensional model of substantive equality is pioneered by um, Professor Sandra Fredman at the University of Oxford. And it's a model of equality that recognizes that the meaning of equality can't be reduced to any single normative value, such as consistency or income or dignity. Instead, substantive equality pursues harmoniously four dimensions. The first is disadvantage, 
our equality laws should be not looking to necessarily ensure consistent treatment, but recognize that because of the historical disadvantage, because of these histories of inequality, disadvantage clusters around historically marginalized groups. The second dimension is recognition that our equality law should seek to eliminate stigmas, stereotypes, and prejudice, and to promote individual worth. Our equality laws should also aim to, for participation, the participation dimension, and aim to amplify voices marginalized in political and social decision-making. And the last key dimension is structural. We should work to dismantle structures that have been constructed on dominant norms and, and patterns and transform our institutions so that they don't only accommodate difference, but they actually valorize different life choices. And using this model of equality, we can really see that there's a lot more going on than simply mathematical income poverty. So turning first to the disadvantage element. The work conditionality. You have to go seek 16 hours of work to escape the benefit cap. This condition doesn't account for single mothers' antecedent disadvantage. Single mothers have a greater responsibility for the care of children. And single parenting is highly gendered. 92% of single parents in the UK, the court finds, are women. So single mothers, because they have this responsibility of care, can't go out into the paid market and find work in the same way as men who have, generally speaking, fewer care responsibilities. A substantive equality approach wouldn't treat single mothers consistently with all other groups. It would recognize the burden of care that already exists upon them. So it moves us beyond this idea that we have to treat everybody similarly and recognizes that differential treatment might be needed because of these larger histories of patriarchy around who provides care for children. And a really, truly substantive approach to benefit reform would seek to break these cycles of disadvantage and alleviate burdens of care by bringing men into the frame, encouraging men to undertake care work, and redistributing care to the state, seeing care as a public good. The government in these cases does try to say, well, we, we do offer uh, entitlements to care. We're not, we're not just leaving these, these poor single mothers to find 16 hours of work and manage and care for all their children. We're offering entitlements to childcare. But actually these entitlements the government's offering are a bit of an illusion. The parliamentary report uh, published a little bit recently really does quite powerfully illustrate that the entitlements are all again, due respect to the government, are useless because the administrative difficulties of accessing these entitlements to childcare make women poorer. And the entitlements to childcare don't actually match how expensive childcare is anymore. So the, it's, it's not really redistributing care in any meaningful way. Turning to the second dimension, recognition. There are a lot of stereotypes in the benefit reforms that go really, really uninterrogated um, by the court and are actually really, really important for showing that these benefit reforms are discriminatory. And the, the um, prejudice stereotypes that are in these reforms are quite common across many jurisdictions. The first one is that the law conceptualizes poverty as a personal moral failing. You, you're a bad person. You failed because you're poor. So we can see this because the combination of the benefit cap, you're, you can only entitle to this much support from the state, and the work conditionalities, they frame poverty as a personal moral failing. And the government gets pretty close to saying it quite that explicitly in the pre-legislative debates. They keep referring to the benefit cap and the work conditionality as a way to disincentivize and discourage benefit dependency. So the point of these restrictive reforms is to stop people from depending on the state and depending on, on welfare. And this idea of dependency paints these single mothers as lazy, as work shy, as these sort of Reagan era welfare queens. Benefits then are like seen under this sort of model of poverty as a personal moral failing or, or needing to cap or discourage people from relying on benefits. Benefits, if we don't have this cap, benefits are then this like decadence for scroungers to just enjoy the, the economic windfall of. And, we can, and the, the work conditionalities really operate this way. They're based on this assumption that single mothers are so lazy that only severe financial incentives, like severe income poverty, can motivate them into paid work. So that's obviously a, a massive stereotype that people are poor because they're lazy. And it's also evident the government thinks this 
in some of the mitigating efforts it rolled out when the cap and the work conditionalities came into place. The government said, we're going to, you know, we have to recognize the income poverty of the cap is, it's a real thing that's going to happen for people. We'll roll out advice for how they can mitigate the impacts of income poverty. And the advice was how to negotiate with your private landlord and how to budget. This implies that single mothers are poor because they're financially incompetent or they're incapable of budgeting. And the lower courts actually found that the extent of the income poverty imposed by the cap was so extreme, that you couldn't mitigate it by prudent housekeeping. So the government just assumes people are poor because they're either lazy, they don't know how to budget, but actually that's, that's not what's at stake and it's ignoring larger structures around why people are poor. It's, it's not individuals who are lazy. And the benefit cap and the conditionalities basically are a stick to discipline the laziness and financial waywardness of single mothers. The second stereotype that's in this legislation, when we look at the child tax benefit, is about disciplining women in poverty and their sexuality. In restricting the child tax credit to two children, this expresses a negative value towards women in poverty and their reproductive choices. And this ties into long-standing stereotypes on benefit broods, that women have children to access more benefits. Basically, the law is seeing women as in poverty as so sexually promiscuous, as so incapable of making careful decisions about when and where to have children, that they, they need these negative financial incentives. And this is really evident when we look at the exemptions to the child tax credit. So in certain cases, you can if you have three kids, you can get the child tax credit for all three. And that's if you've been raped. If a woman can prove her third child is a result of rape, she is worthy of support and can get the child tax credit. If the third child is not the result of rape, she's not worthy of support. So the state's really saying women's worth and of state support is conditional on their consenting or not consenting to sex. And the third stereotype at play is the devaluation of care work. The benefit cap is based on myths that when you're a single mom, you are not working when you take care of your kids. It doesn't recognize the unpaid work single mothers are already performing for their own children. This, this type of unpaid care work doesn't activate the conditions for state support. Only people who are economically productive are deemed worthy of state support. So there's this uh, great paper where this woman interviews a bunch of people who are on universal credit to their, their experiences of it. And she comes to the conclusion that it's kind of ironic that if mothers want to escape the cap, she can go into the market and provide 16 hours of care for other people's children and escape the cap. But if she provides those same 16 hours to her own children, she's subject to the cap. So basically the, the law is just continuing to value and ignore and marginalize unpaid care work. The third dimension is participation. And this dimension of equality seeks to promote inclusion in decision-making processes, to recognize that because of historical disadvantage, many groups have been excluded from equal participation in politics and decision-making. And there are two ways that single mothers are excluded in um, this, these cases. One is they're just actually erased from the judgments. There's, the majority judgment in one of the cases doesn't even mention anything about the claimants. So they're stripped out of the case, which is antithetical to what substantive equality is meant to be about. It's supposed to be a deeply contextual analysis. It's only in Lady Hale's dissenting judgment, which is like 169 paragraphs in, that we actually even find out one fact about who these people are. And they're also excluded, more importantly, from the pre-legislative political consultation debate. The people most affected by these policies, there's no strong evidence that they've been engaged. All of the pre-legislative consultation debate is from elite participation and not directed towards single mothers. And the last dimension of equality is the structural dimension. And this final dimension demands that the system of social benefits can't exclusively be based on one dominant norm or pattern. An equal benefit system respects women's life patterns, their choices, and the gendered constraint on choices. And here, the biggest problem is the benefit system does not recognize the discriminatory structural ba gender barriers that already exist in the labor market. Single mothers are, their em employment rate is quite low because they, they struggle to access the labor market. To escape 
the benefit cap, they have to find 16 hours of work. So you have to find 16 hours of work that fit around delivering and collecting children from school. That can often be from multiple schools if you have more than one child. You have to find affordable daycare, which as I said earlier, could be an illusion. And you have to find a job that will allow you to deal with student child illness, school closures, we saw with COVID and lockdown, and care over holidays. And the stereotypes that already exist about how much mothers are not committed to work means that single mothers tend to cluster in low paid, precarious, and part-time work. And they struggle to just even get work. So finding a job that will provide you the income you need to afford childcare is, is very, it's an insurmountable obstacle. And the benefit cap then and the work conditionalities are really difficult for single mothers to escape. So in summary to this idea about what kind of model of equality that we're talking about here, the discriminatory impact of the benefit reforms is so much more than income poverty. The substantive model of equality in the four dimensions can help us see that the benefit reforms are actually an intertwined helix of income poverty and gender status-based harms. They exasperate harms that already exist by single mothers, they're based on pernicious stereotypes, they exclude the people most affected by the law from consultation, and they're blind to pre-existing structures in the labor market. And this takes to the second strand of my argument about what's the role of the court now? So the court does this analysis and it comes to the conclusion, it does not come to my conclusion, it comes to the conclusion that all it's happening here is income poverty. And they don't see these gendered harms, but they do find there's been discrimination, so then they move on to justification. But the thin model of equality, that myopic fo focus on income poverty, has, an, as I said earlier, has a negative effect on the role of the court and how the court sees itself in reviewing social fiscal policy. And the thin model of equality, I would argue, trips up the court and they get a bit confused. And putting substantive equality at the center can help us understand both the degree of deference that is owed, and it can help fruitfully shape the proportionality analysis. So turning first to the degree of deference, how much deference does the court owe the government when it's reviewing social fiscal policy? Again, this is a question that has people very divided and lots has been written about it. One important factor to remember is that the degree of deference is a really highly contextual. It's very sensitive to the matrix legal and factual of the case. So the concept of equality and what's actually happening in these cases should play a really pivotal role in helping us calibrate the level of scrutiny. And I would argue that the way the court splits income, uh, sorry, splits equality between income and status and then basically ignore its status, wrongly frames the discriminatory impacts, which then wrongly balances the degree of deference away um, being too deferential to government. So if we remember, economic equalities are promising us through the political process, and there's this long line of thinking that courts shouldn't adjudicate eco economic inequalities because they don't have the democratic mandate to wad into complicated, wad, wade into complicated issues of resource allocation. And the majority judgment basically goes down that line of thinking. Courts shouldn't be involved in the distribution of resources. That is a democratic issue. The court's not elected. We need to have a high degree of, of deference owed to the government. We can see, this comes up quote after quote in the judgment. Uh, benefit reforms are a medical of public judgment. Even if the benefit reforms are harsh, the court says, they've been approved by parliament, so the court shouldn't interfere and accountability for this lies in the political rather than the legal arena. So again, seeing economic equalities as being political rather than legal. But the court's rationale for using this high degree of deference is flawed because they're saying the, their rationale is that the impact's only income poverty. But we have just argued that actually there's status-based inequalities deeply, deeply embedded within these reforms and status-based inequalities are the quintessential issue of discrimination law and quintessential role for the courts. Lady Hale, I believe it's Lady Hale, or I'm pretty sure it's Lady Hale, she says there's no no-go areas in discrimination law. Status-based harms can and do shape fiscal and social policies. They're not, status-based harms aren't confined to just certain areas of life. They, they, they go everywhere. And our commitment to substantive equality means the court has to interrogate status-based harms wherever and whenever they arise. 
and recognizing that there's this complex interplay between status and economic inequality in these cases pulls us away from that high degree of deference into a more searching standard. And I would argue the proportionality standard. And this is the second um, prong of where standard of equality can help shape the justification analysis. It can help us understand some key questions the court can reflect on when conducting the proportionality analysis for the benefit reforms or from a lot of social fiscal policy. In these cases, the government argues it has three aims in pursuing the benefit reforms. It wants to make fiscal savings. It wants to incentivize individuals into work, instill an ethic of work and reduce welfare dependency and improve benefit fairness. The aim of incentivizing people into work, of instilling a work ethic in them, as I said earlier, is deeply ingrained stereotypes that single mothers are benefit scroungers who are seeking economic windfall. And reforms that are based on stereotypes should not be seen as legitimate under proportionality analysis. They proportionality can help flush out and do some of the analytical lifting work of what is legitimate. There's also some issues about the, the standard of equality brings into question the means and fit of the reforms. So again, the court could do a better job at asking questions about. So the incentive to work, which is the, the government stated aim, it can, is achieved through plunging single mothers into poverty. Again, that's based on demeaning belief that single mothers won't work unless they have this financial stick beating them. It's also asked, Lord Kerr asked a really important question, like this incentive only works if it's a viable option to go get a paid job in the paid market. And that isn't a viable option for a lot of these single mothers. And the, the government's kind of ignoring the reality of discrimination in the labor market. There's also emerging empirical evidence that there isn't a really good means and fit, that the benefit cap is not really moving people into paid work the way the government assumes it will. So the standard of equality can also should make us raise some questions about the government's way, the way the government's gone about designing a fair benefit system. It wants to improve fairness. It should make us question though, does punishing single mothers through income poverty make the benefit system fair? There's a recent House of Lords report that raises this exact question. Like, how is a benefit system fair if it's based on the experiences of one type of person, an able-bodied, working-aged man without care and responsibilities? A fair benefit system would treat all people as equally worthy of protection, not some just an idealized person. And our belief that the benefit system is fair can be enhanced if we know the benefit system isn't trying to punish us for our life choices. And one, the last way that standard of equality can help, or the, even standard of equality mandates uh, a thorough interrogation of the benefit, of the impact of the benefits, is in that final weighing and balancing of proportionality. The question under the weighing and balancing really is, is the cost of single mothers worth it? Is the, the impact on the single mothers, is it outweighed by the overall benefits that the benefit reforms are meant to achieve? And to answer this question, you have to map out both sides of the scale. So there has to be a detailed assessment of what are the costs of single mothers. And that's where the substantive equality four dimensions is very helpful. We can see these different ways that the benefit reforms are impacting on women. But the court doesn't do that. It, it, the amount of time the judgment's given over to understanding the impact of the reforms is very, very tiny. But it does do a great job of mapping out what the government wants to achieve and what the government's aims are. And so if you have a very, one side of the scales is really opaque, but the other side is really detailed about all the things that benefit reforms are going to do for society, it then becomes really easy for the court to say, well, the cost isn't too high to bear for single mothers. But that's, again, it's a flawed balancing because one side of the scales isn't given the same attention as the other side of the scales. And the court hasn't asked some really key questions, like, how big are the budget savings that the benefit reforms are going to generate? What are the administrative costs of implementing these reforms? A proper weighing and balancing argument mandates the court really do a proper equality analysis. So just to sum up, fracturing equality and fracturing accountability for equality between two different concepts and two different actors is artificial and misleading. The impact of benefit reforms, and not just benefit reforms, but lots of um, laws and policies that touch upon 
income and touch upon status are intertwined. We can see that gendered status harms are at underpinning a lot of the benefit reforms. And understanding the substantive equalities that are perpetuated by the reforms also makes it much clearer about what the role of the court is in adjudicating on socioeconomic policies and laws. So I'll leave it there and I'm looking forward to discussing my arguments. Great, thank you so much, Megan. That was a very, very powerful critique on the current uh, adjudication of these kind of claims. So we have stopped recording.